Welcome to the sixth edition of the 2021 So Physics Matter Colloquia series, so prepared in the forum or by the Forum of International Physics, the FIP, in the framework of Physics for Development Program at the American Physical Society. So our live online event, so primarily target center of excellence for the partners country of the Sesame Light Source, so which is a project supported by the APS. So five and lighting colloquia so were introduced in December 2020 by Luisa Cifarelli. And since March 2021, so we have traveled virtually in space and in time. So with topics related to physics, ranging from paleontropology to wildfire music of physics, the scientific woman in the Middle East, and today the quantum information. So, and many more exciting stories that so can be watched from our website. So, so today, so I will first introduce the member of our panel, then our prestigious speakers. So, Andrea Lossi, so who is uh, the scientific director of the Sesame Light Source in Jordan. So in the FIP, so my name is Christine Dahl and I work at the European Inspiration Source in Sweden. I'm the vice chair of the FIP and the other member of the FIP executive committee share line. So include Luisa Cifarelli from Bologna University in Italy, Alan Hurd with our current FIP chair uh, from Los Alamos in the US, and Joni Mella from the ICTP in Trieste, and Marilena Longobardi from Switzerland with supporting the FIP newsletter where you can find a lot of information also from what we're doing. So today we have the honor so to have our guest speaker and to have as well the introduction for this uh, uh, event, which is co-hosted from Iran. And so Professor Mohamed Raza Echadi, so he's uh, obtained of his PhD in physics from the, the Sheriff University of Technology in Tehran in 98. He has worked in the Max Planck Institute, so for polymer research in Minsk in the and also at the University of Columbia in Vancouver. And in 2004, he joined the, the Sheriff University of Technology where he held a position so since 2013 as a professor. So he applies statistics, physics, and simulation to various problems of soft matter, complex and biological system. So he has been elected as the president of the Physics Society of Iran since 2016. So this will be our first uh, short introduction. And he will then also maybe complement so the introduction of our guest uh, today in terms of the presentation for the, the quantum field and the application to quantum information by Professor Vahid Karimipour, who gets uh, his degree in electrical engineer, so and then his PhD in physics, also from the Sharif University of Technology in Tehran in 93. And then he has been a professor of physics so since 2001 in that uh, university. So his research interest covers the theoretical aspect of quantum information, including entanglement theory, quantum channel, refers, reference frame, and topological uh, quantum computation. So he is uh, the editor of the European Physics Journal D, the International Journal of Quantum Information, the Turkish Journal of Physics, and he's an outstanding referee at the American Physical Society. And he's also a Simon Associate at the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, the ICTP. So with uh, all those uh, uh, different information from our guest uh, uh, speaker, so I let now the flow so to Professor Reza uh, Atiedi, and uh, we will know more about this uh, fantastic world uh, of quantum information. Thank you very much for the introduction and organizing this interesting online series. Let me first share my screen. Uh, I hope you can see the screen and everything's okay. And okay, that's good. And I also would like to thank for giving me this opportunity to have a brief introduction to physics in Iran. I will keep it short to let uh, jump soon for scientific part and to hear more from Wahid. Uh, Iran is 
a very ancient country with a rich history. It covers over 1.6 million square kilometers with an uh, over 83 million population. The capital is the city Tehran, where it is hosted the first modern university of the country. The University of Tehran uh, was initially founded as a teacher training center in the, in the mid 19th century and was re-established re in 1934. And it actually was the first uh, modern university of the country with a physics department as part of a faculty of science. And Sharif University of Technology to uh, which I'm affiliated was founded in 1966. Uh, it has established as one technical university and just engineering department with three basic science department, mathematics, physics, and chemistry. Okay, let me back a decade ago. Uh, in 1983, when uh, the universities uh, opened just after a three-year break, that is, it was called Cultural Revolution, just after 1979 Iran Revolution, we had such kind of a break for the universities. And just after that, at 1983, we have 15 universities. Almost all of them has a physics departments, except for those that was humanities or something like that. Uh, and the number of the physicists, the people that uh, had a doctorate in physics was about less than 80, and some of them left the country uh, just after the revolution. Uh, a couple of the universities, just a few universities had graduate programs and just only uh, in master, they had the masters and uh, the uh, published papers could be counted on the fingers of both hands. But I believe everything has changed since that year, 1993. This is a picture of a graduation gathering for the first physics PhD student in Iran in the Sharif University of Technology. There are four graduates in the, the middle of the picture accompanied by their professors and other PhD students. Our today speaker, Wahid Karimpur, also is between, and that's my introduction to the today speaker. And uh, everything just after that picture, I think it uh, changes in the country. If we go today to the uh, SJR, we can see that SJR ranked Iran for the publication in physics and astronomy for 14 in the world and for the citation 16. And you can see the whole, the trend of the publication is changed from the, that year that I'm saying that's historical, uh, that historical picture, that's everything is changing. That yet these graduate the students became the professor in the universities and other universities and the starters uh, to uh, teach and uh, train the new generation of the physicists in the country. Now the country has 35% of the output of the Middle East and 3%, about 3% of the output of the uh, world. Today, the Physics Society of Iran, PSI, has about 12,000 members, and uh, including around 3,000 uh, people that have members that ha have a master degree of the, in science or a PhD in physics. And uh, it's it could be nice to compare with the number of the members of the society in 1983, that it was only 43. And now 
in addition to the Dedist society, we have some spin off societies, actually the societies that has, was part, were part of the physics society in the years ago, but now they act as individual and uh, independent societies like Astorium Cal Society of Iran, Vacuum Society of Iran, Iranian Society of, for Optics and of Photonics, Geophysical Society for, of Iran, Society for Nuclear Physics and Technology. And the, the PSI organizes uh, more than 100 scientific events around the year, conferences, workshops, gathering, public and colloquium talks, and also webinars. It offers seven prizes and has six committees and uh, 10 divisions and forums. The forum of women in physics is one of them. And I would like to remind, remind you the picture, the historical picture that in 1993, that's in this picture, there is no female between the professor, graduates, and even PhD candidates in that picture. But the situation is, has changed during that year. And if we go to the statistics of the, the students in the country, you can see for the if it's the percentage of the females between the students increasing and now it's going for undergrad is almost reaching to a plateau of about 55 percent uh, females for undergrad and for the masters and phds also the percentage is going to the same the trend is the same and uh, what with a time lag. And again, if you look at the number of the faculties in the inside the university, you can see the same trend for the faculties, assistant professor, associate professor, and professor for the years 2001, 2006, 2016, and 2019. You can see that we have a trend of the female increasing the number of the females inside the universities. Okay. Just to be short, in the end, I would like to say some words about the difficulty of to be a physicist in Iran. Uh, they're actually living in a society that is a little isolated because of the sanctions around the world, make some difficulties for in the, our professional life. I have listed some difficulties here that I would I wish that no none of our peers around the world. Uh, never experienced something like that, but it's hard and time consuming visa process to attend international activities and almost no way to transfer fees for conferences, open access journals or society memberships. Very difficult ways to buy materials or instruments. Sometimes it's impossible. And in case of international supports, no way to receive them. And if we pass all of these barriers, and finally, the rejection of the papers with an affiliation in Iran is not an exception. Just I would like to show one to share you one of the, my personal experience. This is a letter from the editor that I have received when, after submission a paper to a journal. And uh, I would just, uh, when you are uh, reading the response, let me finish my talk uh, with uh, thanks to APS and Christian and Joe and the other panelists to, for organizing this event and thank uh, my colleagues Reza Mansouri and Rez Azam Irayzad for sharing their comments and data for this short report and also thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. So now we will uh, so leave Savait Karimi for giving his uh, star presentation. And also maybe for the logistics. So if you want to ask questions, there is a raised hand, but I think maybe the best is to wait the end of the presentation. And you can write down as well on the chat. So the different question. If you want, you can even ask them in person. I would say it's quite a, a nice adventure for us as well. And potentially you would have also a live answer in person. Maybe it's recorded so we cannot translate and put it. But you are more than welcome to write down in the chat box the question, please.
these are question and answer. Okay, okay thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank you, Christy, Joe, Alan, Louise, Olin? and <clears throat> do you hear me? No. That works. Do you yeah. hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity to <clears throat> talk in this wonderful series of colloquia. And thank you, Joe, uh, Christine, Alan, Andrea, and Luisa for, this in, for organizing this activity. And especially thank you, Sarah, for teaching me how to use this mouse in this Zoom. Uh, I will talk about new horizons in quantum theory. And uh, uh, my audience in this talk, uh, the audience that I have uh, taken into consideration are uh, graduate students and uh, even undergraduate students. Most of the things that I say maybe are well known to the experts and to professors. But I think that uh, it may have something new even for the young researchers. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, in describing these new horizons, uh, I will not talk about much of, uh, about our activities in our group, but uh, uh, if uh, somebody's interested, let's see how this goes on. Okay, if somebody's interested, he can go to our homepage. And then uh, if he goes to our homepage, uh, especially he will see this icon above, Sharif QI group in which you can see all our publications, activities, uh, teaching notes, and et cetera. And especially, you can also see these series of uh, international conferences, which we have organized from 2007 to here, biannual conferences. And then uh, the last one was in 2021, which was online, but all the other ones have been physical conferences. And uh, so any of these uh, students or young researchers who are interested can uh, just write to us and uh, uh, visit our group. We will be very happy to host them. And fortunately, uh, when the pandemic is over, we will resume our conferences again. So my talk will be mostly about the uh, new horizons in quantum mechanics, new ideas, grand ideas, and uh, what has inspired us and our group, uh, small group to uh, uh, follow these uh, uh, developments in quantum mechanics. Uh, I decided uh, mostly to talk about these things rather than to talk about uh, our uh, individual uh, contributions, which is um, mostly technical and maybe not so interesting for the general audience. Uh, so as we see, this is a famous picture, which is uh, probably uh, one of the most popular pictures uh, in physics, a uh, picture which uh, probably will never repeat again in, the, in this scale. Uh, it's about, I think, that 1927, one of these uh, Salve conferences, uh, when the quantum mechanics was uh, uh, finally formulated in its full uh, fledged form by Schrodinger, Dirac, Heisenberg, and Pauli, and Bohr. And uh, I think that all of them are here in this uh, conferences, in this picture. And now after 100 years, you see that uh, quantum mechanics has resurged after 100 years uh, due to simple ideas and elegant experience. And uh, in this talk, we want to see why. And uh, what we will see is that uh, the resurgence of quantum mechanics is not due to uh, highly advanced uh, and technical uh, developments like quantum field theory, quantum gravity, and so on. It's due to very small and beautiful and completely simple problems that nobody has uh, paid attention in these 100 years before. Uh, the first thing that we should note is that the present century, I mean that the, the uh, 21st century is a century in which uh, we learn how to manipulate single atomic entities. In this past 100 years, quantum mechanics has been very successful in describing nature, in describing all, all sorts of phenomena. 
and uh, in solids, uh, liquids, gases, other phases of matter, and so on. And has been very successful in development of uh, technology, in, uh, electronic technology, communication technology, and so on. But all of this has been due to the uh, application of quantum mechanics to description of matter in the bulk. So nobody has really uh, been able to or care to uh, test quantum mechanics uh, in the level of individual single atoms to see if quantum mechanics is really true in its full detail when it describes a single atom. What we have uh, seen is that if you describe quantum mechanics, if you use quantum mechanics for description of a single atom, then the uh, behavior of matter in the bulk, when you have billions of atoms, is as expected. But uh, the manipulation uh, of uh, single atoms has never been done before. By manipulation, I mean preparing a single atom in a specific state, then evolve it uh, by some dynamics, and then measure the atom at the end. This has never been done. But the 21st century is uh, uh, a time where we can do this. And by single atom, I mean any single uh, uh, microscopic quantity, uh, entity. It can be uh, an atom, it can be an ion, it can be a spin or photon or something like that. And uh, before going to these ideas, uh, to these three basic ideas, let's see why this has happened. Because uh, we have been successful uh, in uh, obtaining extremely cold temperatures of the order of 10 to minus 9 Kelvin, or even lower, last week was a record. Uh, much below 10 to minus 9 Kelvin, uh, which is tantamount to the speed of uh, atom becoming one millimeter per second, uh, almost uh, uh, at rest. The other achievement is that, is that we have been able to uh, uh, make precisely, uh, extremely precise frequencies with a precision of one to 10 to 17, laser pulses, and extremely short laser pulses with the order of 10 to minus 18 seconds. These three possibilities means, uh, uh, meaning that extremely precise frequencies, extremely short laser pulses, and extremely cold temperatures allows you to uh, really manipulate single atoms, to uh, prepare a single atom in one specific state, to prepare uh, uh, specific dynamics, and then to measure uh, that. As an example, you can for example, take a spectrum of uh, atomic hydrogen or something like that, atomic hydrogen, and then you can start from the uh, ground state and then step by step, you can excite this atom to go up and up and up, and then uh, bring it to very, very high atomic uh, quantum numbers, uh, completely excited one. And then, uh, the shape of the orbital will be something like a torus, and in, if you note, it will be something like uh, 2,000 angstrom diameters. So you excite, you blow up uh, an atom with uh, one uh, angstrom to a ring of 2,000 angstroms. Uh, if you want to have a feeling for that, it means that if you have a stadium with a very small ball in the center of the stadium, then you can blow up this a single uh, ball to uh, blow up to uh, almost occupy the whole of the city or even become larger. So that's uh, the type of thing that uh, manipulation of single atoms can do. So the experimental part of the talk is now over because I am a theoretical person. So uh, that was all uh, was really uh, uh, exciting for me and I wanted to uh, tell you about the experimental uh, achievements. Now I will uh, talk about the theoretical part. And uh, this part, this talk has three parts, A, B, and C. And in each part, I tell you a very small theorem. And after that, I tell you what this theorem implies for technology on the one extreme, and what it implies for deep science on the other extreme. So in each part, we have a spectrum. I tell you theorem, very simple theorem, very simple property. And then I will tell you uh, the application of this to modern technology, to radical technologies. Just 
been never possible before. And the other extreme, which enables us to ask deep questions in science and answer these deep questions, right? So this is the plan of the talk, three theorems and these implications. The first theorem is called the no cloning theorem, which by now is famous and everybody knows about that. It was discovered in 1981-82 by Asher Perez and William Butters. And many people knew this theorem in advance, but uh, in their minds, and they didn't care about uh, formulating it uh, in exact form and publishing it in the same way that uh, Asher Perez and William Butters did it. And you know that uh, it is the discovery of 1981-1982, 80 years uh, after the discovery of quantum mechanics and 60 years after the development of quantum mechanics. And uh, if you look at the proof, the proof is quite simple. Every student of quantum mechanics can, could have done this. Uh, so uh, it shows why this is simple. The theorem says this, there is no quantum process, right? Which can take a state psi, unknown state psi, and a blank state psi, right? Like a copy machine, like a Xerox machine, and produces two copies of psi. There is no quantum process which does this. Which does this. This is the theorem. The statement and the proof is quite simple. The proof is that suppose that there is such a machine, then it should copy the state zero. So if you give it zero, zero times B becomes zero, zero, because zero is copied. If you give one to this state, to this machine, then it can copy one. One times B becomes one times one. Now you give a third state, and the third state by superposition can be plus zero plus one, because we know that quantum mechanics allows superposition. Then we expect that plus times B becomes plus times plus, because plus should be copied. But by linearity of quantum mechanics, you see that the sum of these two relations, because quantum mechanics is linear, plus times B will be zero plus zero, zero times zero plus one, times one, and this is different from plus times plus. It means that there is no such copying machine. By just this simple reasoning, Asher Perez and William Butters prove that there is no copying machine, right? And this is a very fundamental no-go theorem of quantum mechanics. Of course, this is a much simplified version of the theorem. The theorem has some uh, nuts and bolts in it, uh, especially uh, the Point is that uh, the power of this theorem is that uh, you should also consider the state of the world because you can copy psi to a blank state and the state of the world, the whole world, the earth, moon, sun, and galaxies can change. So we will have, if this machine exists, psi times the blank state times the world state becomes psi times psi times this change the state of the world. So the state world changes the world psi. But again, they show that even this is not possible. So this is the famous and very important and very beautiful and completely simple, uh, no cloning theorem. Again, every student can prove this in this generality. Now let's see uh, the implication of this. Uh, after a few years in uh, 1995, no, 1984, after two years, Charles Bennett and Gilles Brassard uh, applied this theorem uh, to a very important and fundamental uh, uh, technology, communication, uh, which we know that uh, is a prevailing technology of uh, today. If somebody like Alice wants to communicate with Bob, instead of using the alphabet of zero and one, which since they are orthogonal, they can be copied, essentially they can use this kind of alphabet, zero, one, plus and minus. This is the essence of this uh, theorem. I'm not telling exactly what Bennett and Brassard do and why this, how this protocol works, but this is the essence of the protocol and this secure communication that uh, is possible by quantum mechanics. So instead of zero and one, you use zero, one, and plus and minus, which couldn't be copied altogether. So if you use this machine, if you use this kind of alphabet, this kind of coding, then nobody can uh, discover what you're saying because nobody can copy. Because when you want to eavesdrop something, you have to take a copy of that 
And since these alphabets, these states cannot be copied, nobody can understand what we are saying. And when we, take, when we talk about uh, these things, we are not really talking about uh, 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 down to earth communications about, for example, military service and these things. We are talking about everyday communication because the today world is uh, all about communication. Millions of people are doing communication with each other on various topics for various purposes simultaneously. And uh, the main problem, the theoretical problem is that uh, uh, you hear everybody and uh, at the same time, uh, you want to everybody hear you, but nobody understands you. And quantum mechanics provides such a thing, such a error. Everybody can hear what you say, but nobody can understand what you say. This is the essence of secure communication, which is provided by quantum mechanics. So this is technology. As I promised, the other extreme is that uh, related to science, pure science. And uh, I tell about uh, two very important implications of the no cloning theory. If we have a cloning machine, we can violate Heisenberg uncertainty principle. That's why people knew this on the, on the back of their mind. If you have a cloning machine, you can violate uncertainty principle. And it's very simple because if you have a cl quantum cloner, you give the state side to the quantum cloner, then it, you can produce many copies. If you can produce two copies, then you can produce many copies because you can use it, the quantum cloner twice, twice, and so on. So on half of these states, you measure psi, measure x, the position, and the other half, you measure p, the momentum. And at the same time, you are uh, measuring both the position and momentum of a particle because you can copy as much as you want and you can measure as much as, uh, as much precise as you want, uh, the position and the momentum. So if you have uh, quantum cloning, you can violate uncertainty principle. This is one of the implications in science. Another implication is much more important than this because it, this relates to uh, consistency of quantum mechanics. The other one relates to the uh, special relativity, which is really uh, mysterious. If we have a cloning machine, we can violate a special theory of relativity and we can have communication faster than the speed of light. In fact, we can have communication in the speed of uh, uh, infinity. Let's see how. Suppose that Alice and Bob have an entangled state, share an entangled state, one square root of two, zero, zero, plus one, one right? Uh, again, this is a mysterious uh, property of quantum mechanics that entangled states can exist, but it's a fact, an experimental fact that such a state exists. Now, if Alice measures in this uh, basis of zero and one, her state, the state immediately collapses. Uh, so that Bob can also uh, measure zero and one. If Alice measures this her state to be in the zero state, then immediately the state of Bob will be zero. If Alice measures one, immediately the state of Bob will be one. So this is a non-local property, right? Uh, even if the space of uh, between Alice and Bob is thousands of kilometers and uh, they have space-like properties. Know that by this thing, Alice cannot communicate anything to Bob because uh, the results of Alice are random. The results of Bob are also random. So Alice cannot send uh, a predefined sequence of zeros and one. Uh, Alice cannot communicate a message of zeros and ones to Bob because everything on the Alice side is random. Consequently, everything on the Bob side is also random. Nothing happens. The same state, however, can be written in this form, plus, 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 minus, minus, right? And now if Alice measures in the plus minus basis, the state of Bob immediately collapses to plus and minus, right? Again, due to non-local property and due to this correlation. Again, Alice cannot communicate anything to Bob by this measurement because everything on the Alice side is purely random. Consequently, everything on the Bob side is also random, right? And the uh, Note that when the state of Bob collapses to plus or minus one and Bob measures in the basis of zero and one, again, what Bob really measures is zero and one with the probability of one half and one half because both plus and minus uh, produce the outcome of zero and one with equal probability. 
So what doesn't have any idea in what basis Alice is measuring her basis, her spin. Alice has no idea. Bob has no idea in what basis Alice is measuring. Therefore, by doing a measurement in the Z basis, zero and one, or in the X basis, plus or minus, Alice again cannot communicate anything to Bob. Nothing is possible. Now suppose that Bob has a cloning machine. If Bob has a cloning machine, then he can think about this question. He can ask what kind of measurement Alice is doing. Is she measuring in the X basis, I mean plus or minus, or in the Z basis, I mean zero or one. If he can find in what basis Alice is measuring, then Alice can use this type of measurement for sending uh, streams of zero and ones when he measures when she measures in the uh, x basis it's a sign that she's communicating zero if she measures in the x basis it's a sign that he's coming she's communicating one so by finding in which basis she's doing her measurement bob can receive a signal and alice can send a signal at the speed of infinity because this collapse happens in infinity at the speed of infinity. Let's see how this is possible. And I uh, tell you in the next slide that if there is a cloning machine, Bob can understand this. Why? It's quite simple. Again, one single formula. Because cloning states make them more distinguishable. Because if you have two states, A and B, with an overlap of one over two, right? When you multiply this, when you copy these and you have two A's and two B's, the product will be one over four because it's a product of the uh, overlap. If you have three copies, if you make three copies, the overlap will be one over eight. And the more copies that you have, the more orthogonal these two states will become. So if you have a cloner, if Bob has a cloner, then all these states zero, one, plus, and minus will become orthogonal and Bob can measure. So he can understand exactly if he has the state plus or minus, which means that Alice has measured uh, her state in the X basis or zero on one, which means that she has measured her state in the Z basis. So by this analysis, Bob can uh, completely understand in what basis Alice has done the measurement and they can communicate with the speed of uh, infinity much much, much faster than the speed of light, and special relativity is violated. So this is a relation between relativity, which is really mysterious, and quantum mechanics. The low cloning, which comes from linearity of quantum mechanics, directly is related to the special relativity. So that's what I was telling that uh, Bob cannot distinguish all these states. N is a large number, and all these states are orthogonal to each other. Bob can measure them. So, so far, so good for uh, cloning. Let's now go to the other problem, superposition. And this is the discovery of David Deutsch in 1982. The basic problem, one of the basic uh, properties of uh, quantum mechanics is superposition. <clears throat> you concentrate on the computation and the, everything that is uh, being done in your computer. Everything is encoded into zero and one, and zero and ones, streams of zero and ones are uh, <clears throat> processed and it uh, becomes a computation, becomes a uh, image processing, becomes sound, becomes music and so on and so forth. These are beats, classical beats. But if you have quantum mechanics, then you can have qubit, which is alpha zero plus beta times one. The question that Deutsch posed himself was that can we use qubits for more efficient computation. And if you leave it there, you go nowhere. The problem is that Deutsch was able to pose a very specific and simple question. He designed a very simple and clever and ingenious question to show that if you can use qubit, you can do computation in a much better way, much, much more efficient way. This was the first step, like the Faraday experiment of uh, induction. Uh, uh, <clears throat> 200 years ago. And then after that, uh, the floodgates opened. 
Let's see what was uh, the question of Deutsch. Suppose that I have a function, is a black box, right? This black box computes a function, right? I will tell you what type of function. So you give zero and one to the function and it outputs zero and one. The black box is computing something, but we do not know why. How it's doing this function, what kind of function it's doing. But they have been, uh, we have been promised that the function that uh, this black box is computing is a specific function. It's either a balance function like this one or a constant function. So what this means, the input is just zero or one because we have one bit. There's only two possibilities. Either you give zero or you give one. A constant function is a function whose output is completely constant. It doesn't depend on the input. So it's either completely zero or zero, or it's all one. This is called the constant function, right? A balance function is one which is balanced between zero and one. So it either gives zero or one, or one and zero, right? And we do not want to find exactly what function this black box is. We just want to find, is it the constant function one of these two, or a balance function one of these two? So this is the importance of the question that Deutsch asked. To pose a very simple question. It's really ingenious, right? And to answer this question, uh, to ask, uh, uh, to determine whether the, the function is constant or balanced, how many calls we have to make with this black box? How many calls? If you think a little bit, you will see that we have to do it twice. We have to give the black box once a zero and once one. If the outputs are equal, we say that the function is constant. If they are different, we say that the function is balanced. There is no way to do it more efficiently. We have to call the function twice. Either you give it zero and then you give it one and then compare the output. So there's no way to do it uh, by uh, a shorter number of calling. You have to call the function twice. What Deutsch did was to show that if you have a qubit, then you can answer the description by just one call of the black box. So what he showed is that he reduced two calls to one call, just that, as simple as that. In its uh, simplicity, I again stress, it's like something that uh, Faraday did when uh, he discovered the induction. He just uh, took a coil and moved the magnet inside and outside the coin. And then uh, when somebody asked uh, what is the use of this, he said that it's just a child uh, which is newly born. But now you see the, today you see generators and the power plants who produce uh, millions of uh, watts of power and uh, uh, run their cities. This is the same thing as uh, uh, Deutsch algorithm, this simple question. Then after Deutsch uh, came other uh, algorithm, more complicated algorithms, step by step, one by one. And then after 15 years, after uh, 20 years, uh, after 12 years, uh, we found factoring large numbers by Peter Shaw, reducing thousands of years of computation to hundreds of seconds. This is the climax of computation. And then uh, as you have uh, here, it has been experimentally uh, implemented, not this type of uh, uh, algorithm, but similar ones, which show that uh, 10,000 10, years of computation can be reduced to hundreds of seconds by the Google machine. So uh, this is all about uh, uh, technology, superposition, and the invent of uh, invention of uh, qubit from bit has enabled us to do uh, large and uh, slow computations, very fast and very efficient. And the essence is that you have a quantum circuit, uh, sort of uh, uh, unitary operators, which act on collections of these qubits. You give it a, a large number, and then it produces the factor of that large number. This is a quantum circuit 
or quantum algorithm or quantum computer. Uh, but I promise that uh, any of these discoveries uh, has two extremes. One technology, which I told you about, and the other has uh, something to do with deep science. Does this have anything to do with deep science? And the answer is, again, yes. Consider the previous quantum algorithm, right? It's a large collection of uh, qubits, which are interacting with each other through this uh, quantum circuit, these gates. Previously, you gave it a large number and you asked for the factors. No, you give it a Hamiltonian and ask for the ground states. Then it can solve it for you. Much, much faster than classical algorithm, much, much faster than analytical work that we do on the papers. So we are entering a new era for solving scientific problems by quantum simulation. This is what really quantum computers will be doing for us. And if any young student or young graduate want to uh, pursue a career, quantum simulation is one of the most promising uh, ones because uh, in the same way that today, computer scientists and computer programmers uh, are very successful and uh, are wanted, uh, in the near future, quantum simulationists uh, will play their role. So we have had uh, these uh, uh, steps of development in uh, solving uh, uh, science problems, because most of the development of science is not about only <coughs> uh, <coughs> finding uh, revolutionary principles or finding new uh, ideas, uh, sometimes it's all about uh, new methods. In the 19th century, on the top, we had only analytical methods. We had to use pens and papers and uh, a large arsenal of, uh, arsenal of uh, methods of uh, special functions, differential equations, uh, mathematical physics, uh, and so on and so forth to solve a problem. Then in the first half of the 20th century, with the advent of quantum computers, we could do, we could solve those problems uh, in the 19th century by numerical methods, by computers. Then in the second half of the 20th century, we could simulate all these things on the monitor of the computer. We could see by our own eyes, the behavior of all these many particles. We could see the behavior of galaxies. We could see the behavior of a uh, uh, solar system, uh, Club, uh, globular clusters, teams, and so on and so forth. Now we enter the era of quantum simulation because no quantum mechanical problem can be solved on classical computers. Uh, there are uh, perfect technical reasons for that, that quantum problems, even small quantum problems, cannot be solved by supercomputers if they are classical. So we are entering a new era of quantum simulations. All our problems in science, which are hugely complex in quantum field theory, in uh, condensed matter physics, in protein folding, and so on. They need quantum computers or quantum simulators for their solutions. So we give the uh, statement of the problem as the uh, input, and we ask for the output as, for example, the ground state, the thermal state, the correlation time, and so on and so forth at the output. But we have to be ingenious enough to uh, pose this uh, problems in a very clever way, in the same way that uh, Deutsch did and uh, uh, Peter Shaw did. And other. Now we come to the part C, uh, which is split into two parts, entanglement and again entanglement, right? And uh, Many of you know about entanglement and its weird properties. I do not want to talk these aspects of entanglement. I want to talk about new aspects, which has been the topic of research in, this, in the last four years, because entanglement is a very old topic. It has uh, been in physics in 1935, from 1935 with the uh, paper of Einstein, Rosen, and uh, Podolsky, and it has been discussed for half a century. Uh, but I do not want to talk about these things. I do not want to talk about non-locality and so on. I want to talk about very specific new problems in science which are related to entanglement. But let's, as promised to you, 
talk about the technology part, and then we go to the science part. The technology part is again uh, something which Arthur Eckert in, uh, invented in 1992, which deals with uh, quantum key distribution. Uh, again, it's about quantum cryptography. Uh, two persons want to establish a secure key between themselves so that they can communicate with each other. So they have to share a uh, unique and uh, equal uh, sequence of zeros and ones. Uh, and then uh, they share an entangled state like this one, the top one. Uh, and then they measure these states one by one. If they mission the same basis, both of them uh, obtain the same thing, right? Zero, zero, one, one, one. If they measure in the same X spaces, they obtain again the same thing, plus, plus, or minus, minus. And then they use this to establish a secure and common key between themselves. This is the technology part, which entanglement allows us to uh, share a secret key for quantum uh, secure uh, communication. Now let's go to see if entanglement has anything to do with deep science. And again, I stress that I do not want to go to this uh, old uh, material about entanglement and non-locality, bell inequality, and so on and so forth. Let's think about and talk about new problems. Uh, this is a development in 2017. And if you look at these dates, they are about uh, in the same issue. 13 December 2017. In the same issue, another paper, 13 December 2017. And there is a story about this coincidence, which I will not talk about, but it's an interesting story. And uh, it talks about uh, quantum gravity and uh, entanglement. And the problem is that, uh, you know, that uh, in high energy physics, uh, people have been dealing with the problem of quantum gravity for more than half a century. And there are different schools who talk about and to investigate quantum gravity. There are, for example, loop quantum gravity school, uh, and there's a huge uh, and active string theory school who want to quantize gravity and united with the other three forces, which we have the Abzu Salam weinberg glashow model for that. So this uh, uh, desire for uh, unification of forces has been with the physics community for uh, from the time of Maxwell, perhaps. And uh, the climax of this desire is the desire to uh, unite gravity with the other forces and to quantize gravity. But quantization of gravity is extremely difficult because uh, you have to quantize the space-time itself, not the matter inside the space-time. You have to quantize the geometry. You have to quantize the Einstein equation, which is nonlinear. And then you run into extreme difficulties. Uh, you run into uh, theories which are not renormalizable, and uh, the infinities cannot be canceled in any way, and so on and so forth. Uh, now the question is, do we need at all to quantize gravity? This is a basic question. Why should we insist on quantizing gravity? Maybe gravity is not quantized at all. And there are voices in the physics community, like, for example, uh, Dyson, who says that we do not leave at all quantum gravity. Let gravity be classical as itself. Maybe when you go uh, to larger and larger scales, then uh, quantum mechanics fades away and uh, large objects who are uh, affected by gravity, they do not need uh, to be quantized. They are uh, doing classical life. So leave physicists alone, let uh, do their job as they want. This question can be settled down by an experiment uh, if we use entanglement concept. There's a very basic observation here. The observation is quite simple. A classical object, here I have written classical field, but really uh, we didn't need this. If you read this paper, they say that a classical system, which has only one observable, because uh, if a system is quantum, it means that it has two non-commuting observables. But if you have a classical system, which I call C, 
then you can prove by one single line that this system which interacts with a quantum object and again interacts with another quantum object q2 but q1 and q2 do not interact with each other they are far apart a classical system cannot entangle these two particles so this process is not possible a classical system interacting with q1 and again interacting with q2 it's not possible it's not able to produce entanglement between two objects right and then you can uh, test the quantumness of gravity by this simple idea. Uh, the basic idea behind this is that uh, if you take the Hamiltonian of interaction between C and Q1 and call it HC1, right, C and 1, and call this HC2, this Hamiltonian, then since this is classical and it has only one observable which commutes with itself, it's not class, it's not quantum, it doesn't have two observables, non commuting HC1 commutes with HC2, which means that the whole unitary operation is the product of two operators, U1 times U2. And this kind of operator cannot entangle Q1 and Q2, right? This is the basic reasoning behind this theorem. And now, if we have a gravitational field and we have two masses, M1 and M2, which only interact with the gravitational field, right? If the gravitational field is classical, it cannot entangle these two objects, right? So we do an experiment, a very precise experiment between two masses, which are interacting solely through gravitational field. If after a while we do not find any kind of entanglement between M1 and M2, it means that gravitational field has been a classical field. It's not a quantum field. That's the basic idea. So uh, you take two objects, and then after a while you see if they are entangled or not. If they are not, gravitation is classical. But of course, you have to implement this idea with very precise measurement. And this is the interferometry experiment that has been proposed in these two uh, papers in different languages, of course, in different uh, techniques. You take two objects, two masses, small masses, and then you pass them to beam splitters, to some sort of grating. This can be molecules, for example. And then you do interferometry with these two masses. One of them uh, becomes to, uh, goes into a superposition of zero plus one, and then it's reflected from this mirror, comes to here, and uh, again, this one, and the other one too. And then during the path that they follow, they have different distances. The distances between the branch one and one is D2. The branch between zero and zero is D2 again, but the branch, the distance between zero and one is D1 and so on and so forth. And then you have different uh, path and different phases that they obtain due to the interaction of gravitation. For example, if the masses follow this zero zero path, right? This L is very long. If they follow this zero zero path, uh, then uh, the phase that they acquire is minus I G M squared H bar D squared because D2 is the distance between these two branches. This is the potential of gravitation. This is the phase that the Hamiltonian gave to these two particles and call it e to the power i phi two zero zero, right? Then if you follow the other path, one one, right? Again, because the distance is the same, you obtain, or the two particles obtain the same phase, e to the power i phi two. But then if one of them follows the zero path and the other follows the one path, the near paths, the phases will be different because the distance is different. The distance is now D1, called the phase e to the power i phi one, one zero. And then if you follow the whole path, which is a superposition of zero plus one in one, for one math or one mass and zero plus one for the other mass, then you can, uh, here we, uh, we have neglect the, phase because the distance is too large. So uh, uh, we omit this uh, phase. Then the 
if you measure the probability of uh, detecting the masses between in these two detectors, D0 and D1, you can find by interferometry if the two masses have been entangled or not by the phases. And you can tune these distances to distinguish whether these uh, masses have been entangled with or not. And by this, you can really decide on the uh, quantumness of gravity. Of course, there are much discussions about this uh, uh, experiment, but uh, it has been in, uh, uh, a large amount of excitement about these results. And uh, uh, we are also uh, thinking about these uh, things with our students and hopefully we may get somewhere. And now we come to the last part, which I call C2, entanglement again. Again, this part has a technology part and a deep science part. Let's talk about the technology part again. We have Alice, a manager of the bank, for example, and uh, she has two uh, staff members, two deputies, uh, whom we call Bob and Charlie. And she wants to pass a very sensitive information, for example, a passcode to Bob and Charlie, but she doesn't trust any of them singly. She wants to pass the passcode to both of them so that when both of them come uh, collaborate with each other, they can uh, recover the key, recover the passcode. How Alice is able to do this? She can, for example, uh, encode the passcode into a sequence of states of zero and one, and then encode zero to zero bar, which is this entangled state, zero, zero, plus one, one. And she can encode one to one bar, which is the superposition of zero, one, plus one, zero. So none of these contain any information for either Bob or Charlie, because uh, if Bob and Charlie separately, measure this state or the lower state, they obtain zero and one by probability of one half. They do not obtain anything. But if Bob and Charlie collaborate, they can determine that the state has been given to them is either this state or this state. Because this state is an even parity state, the sum of the two bits is always zero. And this state is an odd parity state. The of the two bits is always one. So Bob and Charlie can come in, can collaborate with each other and we try the state and the code that Alice has sent to them. This is a secret sharing protocol, one of the simplest sharing protocols. Again, uh, we have done a lot of work on this uh, secret sharing, but I will not enter into it. Uh, so Alice can also use this protocol to uh, <coughs> communicate quantum states to Bob and Charlie. So instead of the states alpha zero plus beta one, she can encode this state into psi bar, which is alpha zero bar plus beta one bar. In the end, Bob and Charlie can collaborate and retrieve the original state psi, right? So the more complicated scheme is the following. Alice has no three deputies and he doesn't trust any one of them but he trusts, she trusts any two of them. So this is a scheme which is called two out of three. So Alice sends a passcode to Bob, Charlie and David. Again, she doesn't trust any of them, but she trusts any two of them. So Charlie and David can retrieve the key, the passcode. Charlie and Bob can also retrieve the passcode. Bob and David can also retrieve the passcode. How Alice does this? She encodes zero to this complicated state. It's rather, uh, at first sight, it's complicated, but if you look at this and uh, play with this, you will see that it's quite simple. So three, zero, three, one, three, two, right? So the step is just zero. She can encode one into one bar. Here, the steps are one. So zero comes to one, two, then one comes to one. 0, 2, 0, 1, etc. And she can encode 2 to this state, 0, 2, 1, plus 1, 0, 2, etc. Okay? Now, if you give this state to any two of 
to these three people, none of them can retrieve the key, right? Because all the measurements are the same for zero, one, and two. But they can collaborate with each other, any two of them. For example, suppose that this state has been given, right? We want to see if zero has been given to uh, Bob and Charlie. Bob and Charlie are uh, collaborating with each other. Bob adds his bit to Charlie, right? His bit to Charlie, and David is doing nothing. So when this happens, this state becomes this state because zero plus zero is zero, but one plus one is become, become, becomes two. Two plus two mod three becomes again one, right? This is the first state. And then Charlie adds back to Bob. Then zero plus zero becomes zero. Two plus one becomes zero again. One plus two becomes zero. And the state becomes factorized, becomes zero times this unique state. And you, if you do this for the other uh, two states, you will see that this original state is always factorized. So Bob and Charlie can collaborate with each other and find which quantum state Alice has sent to them. And this happens not only for Bob and Charlie, but for any two of them, for Bob and Charlie, Charlie and David, and Bob and David. So this is a nice scheme of quantum state sharing. Any two of them can retrieve the state. So there are complicated schemes. You can make more complicated schemes. For example, you can uh, design a scheme and you can encode a state into a state of five states so that any three of them Right? Any three of them can retrieve the states. The majority can retrieve the state. These three, these three, or these three, or any other scheme. This is called a uh, three out of five quantum state sharing scheme. Or you can make it more complicated. For example, here, these states are not encoding, encoded, but you can still encode these extra states by a similar three to five scheme, right? and make it uh, large lattice of states. No, some part of these, uh, some subset of these uh, participants, sorry, can retrieve the original state, which I have written here, right? And then if you do this and concatenate all these things together, you will find something like this, right? Here, uh, a large number of, uh, uh, three to five codes have been concatenated to each other, have been contracted to each other, and a large lattice has been built. And then uh, uh, a system of uh, encoding appears, and the system of encoding is like this one, right? And the system of encoding, if you look at this, you will see that uh, you have these uh, dots in the middle, right? in the middle, and these white dots at the boundary due to encoding, if you look at the boundary dots, by some of these boundary dots, by part of these boundary dots, boundary states, you can see what is inside, right? So this is a state, a quantum state in the bulk, right? In the bulk, which has been encoded into the boundary. From the boundary, from parts of the boundary, you can see what the state is inside the bulk. So this is an example of the quantum mechanical description of the holographic principle. And interestingly, the lattice inside and the geometry inside turns out to be a hyperbolic geometry, which is a model of ADS space. So here for the first time, people have tried to understand the duality between bulk and boundary and the holographic principle in terms of quantum error correction. And this is a new development in which uh, uh, we really for the first time understand uh, a concrete example of this uh, duality. And uh, uh, it's a fascinating subject. Again, uh, something which uh, 
is a relation between uh, some applications and some deep science in Lagan. We also have done uh, some works on uh, these things with uh, our students. And uh, if anybody's interested, uh, uh, we can give more information and detail different system, but I didn't want to uh, distract your attention by uh, differences. And this is the, uh, the paper uh, which originally uh, uh, studied this idea by uh, uh, John Prescott group and uh, his postdocs, holographic quantum error codes, toy models of the bulk boundary correspondence. Of course, this is uh, only restricted to, uh, to two dimensions. Uh, going beyond two dimensions uh, is an open problem, is a fascinating problem, but it's really nice for those people who uh, are working uh, high energy physics and want to see what quantum information has for them. So this is all uh, I wanted to say, I think, uh, and uh, I welcome uh, questions and discussions and uh, as far as I can. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very nice presentation. I think it's it's really good, and and we will have uh, so few questions already that have been staged, and uh, so Professor so Haza will take care of the question and answer, and also feel free, as we mentioned, to write them in text if you want, and uh, we can share more later on as well with uh, uh, the website and uh, potentially as well with uh, uh, different link uh, that I will send on the chat box. So Professor so. Okay, yes. There are some questions here. I think you can read the questions yourself, but I can read that. Murat Telmini asks, what about the ability of variational quantum algorithms to calculate so, the excited states of the system? So let me see the question, right? Uh, you can see this question, that's right. The question and answer, the tab in the bottom of the I see the chat box. You said the chat no, box. Next to the chat box, you can see that's the quantum answer Q and A. Oh, okay. I see, I see, I see. Q and A. What about the ability of variational quantum algorithm to calculate the excited states of the system? Uh, I'm not actually uh, an expert in quantum, in variational quantum algorithm, but I know that uh, there has been uh, tremendous activities in this new thing. And uh, people are really uh, trying hard to, uh, to use variational quantum algorithm. And it's successful, I think, for uh, answering this question. What is this, the second one? What is the role of quantum interpretations and quantum information theory? Mm, I can say that uh, uh, quantum information theory, if you look at this as a, the, uh, uh, generalization of uh, classical information theory, interpretations has no role in that. Uh, I can say that there is no role for quantum interpretations, but maybe if you want to, for example, uh, to discuss foundations of quantum mechanics, for example, right, the role of non-locality or uh, parallel world and so on and so forth, then maybe yes, there are some role for quantum interpretations. The next question is interesting, Risa. According to your classification, deep science is the one is not easily observable or implementable in a lab. Then it's still science by definition. I didn't imply that, that uh, deep science is not easily observable or implementable in a lab. It is. The experiment which are doing in they are doing in uh, uh, on gravity, they are doing in they want to do it on spaceship. Uh, they are doing in the lab, and it's deep science. I didn't say that deep science is not implementable in the lab. It is in implementable in the lab. It should be, otherwise it's not science. Yes, uh, Murat Murat Elmini says that maybe. 
Both Einstein candidate states can be a good candidate for implementing interferometry experiment. Yes, I agree. Can you go to the yes. next one? Yes, that's right. Uh, I had this, uh, uh, yes, uh, it's true, but there are estimates. There are estimates for the, uh, uh, for the parameters. On the order of 10 to minus four, uh, 14 kilograms. This is the, uh, this is the order of magnitude of the masses. And then uh, uh, a, few, a few millimeters or centimeters is the order of the length. And a few seconds is the order of the time that you have to run this interferometry, depending on the uh, type of experiment that you do. So it's, they say that it's feasible in the near future. There uh, are more. Is questions. that shape of bulk boundary cruelty an example of Penrose tiling? No, it's not because Penrose tiling is irregular and it, it uses two tiles uh, and is tiling of the uh, Euclidean geometry. But these tilings are tilings of, first of all, the regular, and for that regular, they, they are tiling of uh, hyperbolic geometry. They are not Penrose tiling now. Uh, how do you see the future of quantum thermodynamics? Uh, as a humble researcher, I see the future of every field uh, shining. So, uh, Abdul Basset, in the cloning term part, we said that as Alice and Bob don't know what basis is the other person making his measurement? Faster than light communication is impossible. But what? Some kind of pre shared information about what basis they would be their mission. If they have a pre shared measurement about their uh, basis, then uh, it's not communication anymore. Communication is what that you instantly uh, decide what to send to, the, uh, to your friend. Anything that you have shared before is not a communication at this instant. It's a communication in the past. Uh, Ermira Abbasi asks, what is your suggestion for youth and teenagers who want to study quantum theory in university? Work hard, just that. And okay. uh, learn your basic quantum mechanics deeply and then uh, take a few courses in quantum information. We give two courses in quantum information, at least, in fact, three courses in quantum information and you can take these courses and then you can start your research career. And Christian asked me to encourage audience to, if they want to ask questions in Farsi, it's allowed also that because I can answer the question in Farsi. If anybody is interested, Iranian interested to ask question in Farsi, it's a lot. And, and so indeed, you are so encouraged. <laughs> and, and we can share as well the, the microphone. So with anybody, so whether in, in person or in, uh, in English or in French or in uh, Italian. <laughs> so there is one question in the chat from Alan Hurd. Exactly. We have and to I think that's, that's to Reza and Vahid, I'll, I'll just read it because this is, um, oh, sorry. He asked two questions now. I'm, the first question was uh, to Reza and that's the gender equity in Iranian physics is impressive. Did female participation grow spontaneously or intentionally through PSI programs? Oh, actually I have to say that's 
uh, it's not easy to answer the question because it, it, I think the part of the uh, increasing is as re a regular uh, trends for not only the, for the country and the world, all the world, but anyway, I expect I that uh, expect that the starting graduate courses in Iran actually uh, boosted this increase. Actually, mm -hmm. let, me, let me follow up with that question, Reza. Uh, I think what I, what you just said is that the the cultural makeup of Iranian science uh, led spontaneously to this uh, gender equity. Is that what you just said? Actually, I have tried to skip a, about these points because it's sometimes how my feeling. That's because I think the Iran society is um, um, somehow. Uh, a conservative universe, uh, society, and like the other societies in the Middle East, uh, the, the families and uh, have uh, some restriction for the uh, the female uh, girls to come, the women to come to the society. That's from the conservation of the inside the families. But now, uh, after the revolution, I guess that somehow they uh, trust the environment, the university, environment inside the university and let the girls come out. And that's a way that usually girls come out of the home. That it is encouraged to, uh, the females to uh, go to the universities. And there, there was no restriction from the families in that period of time. That could help that we have a jump in the increasing of the females in the universities. And now in the future, we expect that this increase in the, in the universities and the students affected the number of the females in, the, in some uh, high level position inside the universities, like the administrative or teaching position inside the university. Anyway, if we believe that trend, trend that we can see from the, for the girl that comes to the universities, increasing the number of the females, we expect that this, with the, some kind of the uh, time lag, we can see, we could see in the future, the most number of the, more number of the female in the administrative and uh, faculty position inside the universities. And how about for physics in particular? Because that that's no, a, no, no a special, no difference actually. Have, of course, in some uh, fields we see more females, and uh, for example, before even we have such number of the females in the physics, we could see the number increase of the number of the females into some other fields like art or. Uh, medicine or something like that. And the physics was uh, after this field of the study, but now the physics also is, has the same population in the uh, number of the females. Uh, well, the same almost for the other uh, fields of the study in the country. The number of the uh, females in all of the fields in the inside the university are uh, almost high. You cited an IUPAP report on this topic in your presentation. I wonder if you uh, could post that somehow, that report for, for IUPAP. Uh, yes, we have some uh, communication with IUPAP and actually we are going mm -hmm. to, we are going to write some letters to the IUPAP actually. Yeah, yes, I'll, I'll stop, okay. Joe. <laughs> okay. But okay. we have three more questions, maybe. So, Raza, if you want to, to look at from the question and answer, Shielda. So, how PSI was able to operate uh, so the quantum labs in Iran? So, I think it's very interesting. Uh, to operate quantum lab in Iran. Uh, actually, we have a division of the quantum uh, 
uh, information and quantum technology inside the PSI. That's why it is part of that, uh, this division. And we are thinking about that, but uh, PSI has no resources to, us, to start a lab by itself, but we can encourage some uh, bodies to have the source for some such uh, support to attract the support for the such kind of the labs. And uh, we have some communication, we have some contact with the, some bodies inside the country, but at the time, I'm not sure that's how we could be optimistic about having a quantum, a very operated quantum lab in the near future. Maybe Vahid can uh, complete me. I was, I was reading the questions, please uh, repeat the question. Uh, the question is that uh, how PSI was able to operate quantum lab in Iran? Is it, do you think that is lab? Oh, uh, is there any long or short term program also for this yes. issue? Yes, yeah, there are some initiatives in Iran about quantum labs, but there are different uh, groups who are working on the uh, on this problem. And uh, the role that PSI could have is to uh, somehow coordinate these. Uh, quantum labs so that they can work together and uh, do the uh, elementary experiments in quantum information and quantum optics, and then go a step by step forward. Its role is mainly coordination. Okay, and another question also, I think Swayed can answer that's yes. from right. That's do you have any collaboration with experimental labs to direct them no. to get feedback? Absolutely. No, but uh, some of my young colleagues have. Personally, no. I've always been uh, away from experiment. Otherwise, I had stayed in electrical engineering. I, I didn't want to stay in electrical engineering. I just came for abstract thinking. Okay, there are some other questions. Maybe right, you can answer the is thermodynamic randomness as issue in quantum entanglement? That's from Where you. Where is this question? Quantum Heyman Sahib Saro asks. Is thermodynamics randomness an issue in quantum entanglement? Is thermodynamic randomness an issue in quantum entanglement? That, it, that's the question. Uh, if we want to entangle macroscopic objects, yes, but usually we want to entangle microscopic objects which are under control and they do not have any randomness in that sense. Maybe I can pose this question in the following form. When you entangle two objects, then the noise in between the media, the medium in which these two particles are moving or are staying, it has noise and it breaks the entanglement. So in that sense, yes, it has. But when preparing the, run, the entangled states themselves, no, they are single particles. He meant experimentally, yeah. Yes, yes, experimentally, because entanglement is very fragile. So you make entangled states, but then everything evaporates. Okay, the next one is not actually a question, it's a comment, and I just jump off that. And what the next one is what our PSI plan for teenagers who want to study physics in Iran in future? Uh, PSI, like any other society, has no is not a institution and a university, is it? but just is a supporting body for the people that are, would like to have some activity in the physics, but not any uh, plan for uh, to uh, for uh, to study. But there are some. Uh, outreach activities inside the, that's PSI 
are usually organizers like the physics clubs or something like that that is it's for general audiences that it could be nice for the general audiences to have to uh, attend such kind of such kind of the program that PSI has usually we announce this kind of the events in our website and also in our social media like telegram and uh, whatsapp or something you can find more about the uh, outreach and uh, public events that's usually could be useful for teenagers also I can ask, I can elaborate on this question of payment. Uh, uh, if you want to do uh, entanglement, you usually do it with photons. And uh, then the thermodynamic randomness do not. Uh, how? How? And next question is about the uh, program for physics teachers in Iran. Uh, we have some kind of the gathering for the physics teachers inside the uh, country and its conferences. Actually, we have a good collaboration with Union of the Physics Teachers uh, Societies. We, we know that more than 30 feature, physics teacher society are around the country, and there is a union for the physics teachers so societies. And the, and PSI has a, a, an agreement of the uh, with that that's union to uh, support their program and contribute in their pro, uh, events. That could be good for the teacher. But with new, new teacher training and a pro, a program inside the PSI itself. Usually, teachers can use from the other pro program of the PSI. Okay. And the last question. Uh, for you. Somebody asked me about that uh, if I consider quantum effects in our simulation regarding biophysics. Actually, the question is really interesting question. It's a question that is quantum important in biophysics, the scale of the biophysics or not, by in the biology. That's the, we know that in the some uh, sense it's important. Of course, if you go to the molecules and chemistry, of course the quantum is very into, you know, quantum effects is very important. But what even in the some uh, features of the quantum uh, biophysics, like photo cell, um, uh, sorry, for, uh, as uh, you can see some effects of the con uh, quantum in that kind of the effect. Uh, the, uh, but I usually use classical uh, simulation in um, our biophysics systems. But we go to the coarse grain level and we don't care about the quantum mechanics in that case, just only to see if, for example, different kinds of the molecules or uh, interactions uh, can, could be changed by the change of the environment or something like that, some kind of the uh, quantum calculation in that level could be possible. Uh, at all, I interested in the class, I can, in my answer is that I'm interested in the classical calculations and simulations, not the quantum one. Okay. And also, yeah, okay. I can add, okay, I can add a question. Hey, Jeffrey uh, asked the question the, about the story. The story is that, can I say this? Can I say, yeah. The story is that uh, one day, uh, Vladko Vetral comes to uh, University of London to Bose Group, and he's uh, describing his ideas and the work that he has done with uh, uh, his collaborator, Marletto, and he says that we are, you know, we are uh, having this great idea about gravitation and uh, entanglement and so on and so forth. 
And then uh, suddenly Bose uh, reminds himself that uh, they have done this work before with their collaborative, but they have uh, put it uh, uh, on the drawer of their uh, desk, forgotten for perhaps months. And then they immediately uh, ignite their collaboration again to write the paper uh, as fast as possible. So that's a um, nice one as well. And, and we have more questions as well in the chat uh, side. So for instance, uh, from Ben Zalari asking if you can imagine so any relation between the entanglement and Adobe use ribbon. So this is also bypassing the distance. So bypass the, di the distance. Is it written or not? So it's written, but this is in the chat. So I don't know if you can see it. And this was a bit related to the earlier question. I would think for the, the, the biophysics. So that's why. Okay. So I don't know if you know about that. No, I can't see this. Uh, it's in the chat. PM. It's from the chat. So I can only read it. And, and this is maybe for partial answer. Otherwise I put the link to the courses that we gave with the ASP, where you can find as well exactly some more detail about this biophysics course huh, that was provided Thank as you. well. Uh, and then as well from quantum information from Professor Murat Alim. So I think it's good if some of the, the questions, so you can find potentially some of the answers there too. So I invite mm -hmm. you to save those links. Huh? Uh, then in terms of other questions, there was maybe at the very beginning, so maybe we skip this one, but a question uh, from uh, Tabar. So asking about, so what if they had a protocol and then pre-shared some information on yes. what basis would they measure the entanglement states? I answered this question. If they had a pre uh, sequence, it means that uh, they are not communicating anything at now. Okay, okay, very good. So it means that I think we have covered most of the questions. So from the question and answer and from the chat. So what I would suggest is that I've copied as well the question and we will add them as well so that it could be complementary to the recording like this. Uh, so everybody can really have a, a deeper look uh, and understand. So all those, uh, those aspects, I think it will be valuable. So that's uh, maybe yeah time for everyone to to go back to our uh, duties uh, and uh, so we thank you very much for those uh, wonderful uh, travel. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's very very good. So thank you so much. Thank you very All much. of that. Thanks. Okay. And I think there are some personal questions from Rahi that's about the possibility to join the school. I think this question, question can, could be asked from him personally by email. Yes, via email. My email is on my web page. Okay. That's good. Very good. And, and we will have as well all the recording available. So from our web site, so in the ship one, we will send as well the link to anyone who was registered and you can share as well with others. It will be active for some time. Feel free to as well join the, the FIP. So this is so free if you are in the APS. And now we can also with the email link that I sent earlier answer any questions that you would have regarding the uh, our program. And then I will maybe just finish by showing so the next uh, presentation uh, that uh, will be happening so on the 29. Uh, well, I will put it here on the 20, 28th, sorry, of uh, um, 28th of October. So if you can see it here. So it will be a bit related as well to the question that we had at the end, how to build up capacity as well. And that will be in Palestine this time. So same way like what you commented with PSI, the helping and supporting. In this case, this is with Julish in Germany and all the, the work ongoing. So with uh, so Professor Galeb Natu connected also with uh, Andrea Lossi. So with having possibility as well to describe how research and innovation as well 
well can be uh, can be hosted in those different countries. So I think it will be very uh, exciting as well to listen more about those presentations on the 28th of October at the same time. So uh, so 5 uh, uh, p.m. for um, no, no, 5.30 in Iran. So you're more than welcome to be uh, joining us then. And it will be so 3 p.m. Uh, in Italy, Paris on our side. And not too early, so in the US, so that uh, we can have as well the possibility to have our American uh, colleagues and friends connected. So remember to also uh, connect and uh, look at uh, our social media and uh, to look at all the different presentations that have been already recorded. Uh, we are building mines of information in the field of physics, and this one was um, an excellent one, definitively. A quantum jump, we could say, as well in one sense, uh, and especially by the number of participants. So thank you very much for all of that, and let's stay tuned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And we will announce the next meeting in our PSI website also. Oh, great. If you have any of that, that's perfect. Okay. We can share with the other FIP if you want as well. You have that's a very good. dynamic uh, soci soci um, physical society, definitively. So thank you very much for sharing that thank audience you. with you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks. Later. And thanks for the slides as well that you could share. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.